President and CEO of the Black Women's Health Imperative, and welcome back to Black and Well TV. Because of COVID-19, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of researchers and scientists around the world working to develop vaccines to stop the spread of this novel coronavirus. In this country alone, there are dozens of clinical trials underway. But we need to ensure that there's appropriate representation of the public in the research in these trials. While there may be only a 45% genetic difference and variation between any, any two people, there are important aspects of our lived experiences that may impact the efficacy of vaccines and treatments. In this country, black and brown people have not participated in research in significant numbers, nor are there significant numbers of black and brown researchers. Despite having occurred a long time ago, the horrific experiments of J. Marion Sims, the tragedy of the Tuskegee syphilis study, and the fact that Henrietta Lacks herself would not have had access to the medicines her cervical cancer cells produced still come up when we talk with black women about participating in clinical research. In her book, Medical Apartheid, Harriet Washington describes the dark history of medical abuse and mistreatment of black Americans. So we don't participate because we don't trust the process. What this means is that vaccines and therapeutics could be developed that at best don't help us as much as we'd like. For black women, the HPV vaccine comes to mind. Today, we're gonna to talk about clinical research and two programs, All of Us and Teach, that aim to be inclusive, take into consideration the lived experiences of black women and ensure that we can participate in research in a way that is respectful and works best for our health and wellness. We've brought together two leading researchers from medicine who will talk about the importance of racial and ethnic and gender diversity in clinical research, what patients need to know, and just as importantly, what providers and researchers need to know. We'll also hear from a journalist and author who works with us at BWHI on the NIH funded All of Us program, a program that's designed to educate black women about participating in clinical trials. But first, I'd like to welcome two experts in both practice and research. First, we have Dr. Edith Mitchell, a renowned clinical professor in the Department of Medicine and Medical Oncology and the director of the Center to Eliminate Cancer Disparities at the Sidney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University. Dr. Mitchell is also the vice president and chair of research for the W. Montague Cobb Institute. That's part of the National Medical Association. She is the past president of the National Medical Association and a member of the president's cancer panel. Dr. Martha Dawson is the 13th president of the National Black Nurses Association and an assistant press professor at the University of Alabama School of Nursing in Birmingham. There she leads the highly ranked graduate nursing administration specialty track and serves as the principal investigator for a health resources, resources and services administration workforce investment grant. I just wanna remind the viewers as always, this is designed to be interactive. We know there will be lots of questions. Please use the ask a question function located at the bottom of the screen or the chat function to the right of the screen to send us any questions you might have. So let me begin with Dr. Mitchell. First of all, Dr. Mitchell, how are you faring through COVID-19? So thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, work with you on this program today. It's always a pleasure working with you. And as physicians in this country, we are all concerned about COVID-19 uh, in terms of treatment, in terms of development of vaccines and research regarding this a virus. It's a new virus. We've never seen it before. And even though there are other viruses historically that have been similar, uh, this one is very uh, different. It is more virulent. Uh, it is more contagious. And therefore, we notice from the news media that the infection rate continues to increase, that more individuals die of the complications of this virus every day. 
And unfortunately, the African-American community, as well as other rep underrepresented minority communities, share a disproportionate um, number of deaths mm -hmm. uh, from this virus. And consequently, it is of research interest to all physicians around the country, but of interest to um, the African-American and other minority communities uh, because of the numbers of uh, patients who have unfortunately lost their lives uh, due to complications of this uh, virus. Yeah, I know. Thank you. That is that is something we're going to get we are going to get back to, um, Dr. Dawson. Because I I just always like to check in with my panelists as well. How are you doing, just personally through through all of this? Personally, I think I'm doing very well. Uh, it is a little bit of a stressful time um, in terms of supporting others that are on the front line. At this time, I'm in academia, so I'm able to work from home. So I feel a little bit, I guess, um, more safe than from my colleagues who are out there on the front line. And they are, they're the soldiers that with the foot on the ground. Yeah. They're seeing their colleagues uh, pass from this disease, but yet still they get up every morning, they go into work, uh, and they're still just voicing concerns about not having the personal protective equipment that they need, such as the masks, the gowns, the caps, uh, shoe coverings. And they're also now beginning to voice concern about the increasing number of cases that they're seeing again as testing is expanding and we're now opening up states with very uh, few restrictions. So my concern at this time really are my members and my colleagues that are on the front line. Yeah, and, and we have to just, just to honor them um, as well. Dr. Mitchell, we're gonna talk about participation in clinical research um, and clinical trials for, for our listeners. Could you briefly yes. explain the difference between clinical research and clinical trials? Um, clinical research involves all aspects of trying to understand diseases, disease processes, treatment, and clinical trials represent just one part of clinical research. A clinical trial is usually addressed to um, evaluate and find information about one aspect of either a disease, a medication used to treat diseases, or uh, complications, or, or other aspects. But clinical research involves, I call it the 360, meaning that it uh, connects everything related to um, the treatment of diseases and understanding of diseases. And the clinical trial is testing just one aspect, usually. Okay. So we're in the midst of a, a pandemic, and we honestly don't even know where we are in this, this pandemic just yet. Um, a lot of research is taking place. Why is it important to talk about clinical research in the midst of this pandemic? So it's so important to um, find out all aspects of COVID-19. Number one, how is it transmitted from one person to another? How long does it last in the air? How long does it last attaching to uh, a metal such as a doorknob? How long it's actually in the air and how we can um, receive the virus from one person to another uh, in terms of transmission. Uh, what are the methods of transmission into the body? Once the virus is in the body, uh, how does it work? How does it cause disease and organ complications? And one of the things about this virus is, is that it's not a live particle. It can only become alive by attaching to the cells in the host. Mm -hmm. So as it is transmitted from one person to another, it is not live, only once it invades a person's body. And it is causing so many 
uh, different aspects of disease. We usually think of viruses as causing sore throat, cough, and in a few days, it's over, such as the common cold or regular influenza. But this virus, once in the body, causes many uh, different aspects of invasion throughout. So the nervous system, so that people can't taste, can't smell, and even involves the uh, spinal cord and central mm -hmm. nervous system at times. Uh, in the lungs, it doesn't just cause inflammation, but it causes bleeding. And thromboses are development of clots. Those clots invade the bloodstream and then go on to other organs so that there's heart failure, there's kidney failure, uh, and many other aspects of disease in various organs that finally, uh, unfortunately, lead to death. But it's not just the pneumonia right. that is causing uh, the uh, manifestations of illness. And that's one of the things that's so scary about this is there is no one presentation. Um, and I would imagine once flu season picks up again, that's just going to further complicate the ability to, to diagnose without, without testing. Um, Dr. Dawson, you, you talked about your nurses being on the front, li front line and, and indeed they are. Um, this has to be terrifying for you. I mean, of all the times to be the president of this organization, um, how is the National Black Nurses Association helping to support nurses? Um, you mentioned PPE. Um, what other things are, are you all trying to do and calling for to protect um, those who are caring for, for those of us who are sick? The National Black Nursing Association, uh, we have 114 chapters in 35 states. And so we are working with our local chapters in terms of uh, offering webinars uh, so that we can educate both nurses and others within the communities. Uh, we are also working with uh, different organizations. We just finished a campaign with uh, the Diddy Love team so that we can get equipment to some of our frontline uh, staff uh, in some of the hot spots, such as Chicago and Nevada, uh, in Louisiana, down in New Orleans, where we was actually giving uh, them PPEs uh, that they need. We was also focusing on those patients that we're sending home now. You know, they, they may not have the test results back and they have been given instructions, you know, go home and, and check your temperature. Let us know if you have difficulty breathing. So now we're trying to get things such as thermometers and pulse oximeters. Uh, to give them what they need to be able to monitor their health and then come back, you know, or either contact a health provider when they need that. Uh, we're also uh, doing things such as working with partners in the community just to make sure that the nurses on the units are receiving meals, that we've been, some of our members are selling masks for them. We also have been providing um, what I would call social outlet as well where members can come and they can tell their stories and they have a safe place to kind of let go of some of the stress that they're experiencing. Uh, but we're also in that space of advocacy. Uh, we have been holding town hall meetings in New York, from New York all the way down to Birmingham with our elected officials, congressmen. We've been on some of the president, uh, vice president uh, conferences that they've had. Mm -hmm. We are working with people such as the NAACP, we're reaching out in all avenues that we can, even speaking on programs such as this one, just to get the word out. Uh, because we're also trying to educate people that your health is in your hands and you can't do what you see others doing. You have to make some very critical yeah. decisions for you and your family members, especially parents as it relates to children. And so we're also trying to get rid of some of the myths that are out there. Because, you know, we, we have so many myths, you know, we started off with this is an older person disease. So people started thinking, well, teenagers and children weren't going to get it. Yeah. But putting the facts out there, when we look at the facts, yes, we may have more 65 and olders that are maybe um, suffering more and even dying more from the disease. 
But what concerns me so much, especially as it relates to research, is the number of individuals from age 18 to 64 mm -hmm. that has contacted this disease. And we're talking close to about 500 to 600,000. And what we don't know is what's going to be the end result as they continue to mature. So when you think of that 18 to 44 year old, they're right in the prime of their life in reproductive years. So we yeah. don't know what's on the other side of this. So having uh, that focus from the research perspective is important. But even more important is making sure individuals that look like us are at mm -hmm. that research table. Thank, and thank you for that. That is a perfect lead into my question for Dr. Mitchell to talk about the All of Us Clinical Research Program and its importance to the Black population and particularly to, to Black women. As you mentioned, those are, so many of us in our reproductive years are being impacted, but we're being impacted from the very young to the very old. So Dr. Mitchell, would you talk, talk to us about what this program is and why it's important to participate in it? Certainly, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about the National Medical Association first and how it is involved with the All of Us uh, program. So anyway, of, of course, the National Medical Association is the largest and the oldest national organization representing African-American physicians and their patients and clinician collaborators, such as the... Um, uh, Black Nurses Association and others. Mission of NMA is to advance the art and science of medicine for people of African descent through education, advocacy, and health policy to promote health and wellness, eliminate cancer and other health disparities, and sustain the uh, physician uh, viability. The Cobb Institute is the research arm of the NMA um, and is really involved in developing these educational programs, research programs to help us understand the disease processes that are so important in the African American community. It's especially important for women uh, because women suffer so many uh, disease processes. We're the caretakers, so we take care of everybody else. Yes, we but do. It's well recognized that African American women in this country die from childbirth more frequently than others, lose their babies, so infant mortality is higher, and so many other disease processes. We also know that every patient, every person is different. So just like our hair is different, our skin is different, so are other parts of our body, and so are the disease processes that uh, we experience. So diabetes, for example, is not just one disease. Every person is different, different in how the disease presents itself, different in how there's response to one medication. So one person might respond really well to one medication. The next person may not respond at all and may actually experience adverse reactions mm -hmm. or toxicities, side effects related to the medication. So the All of Us program is a part of precision medicine. The precision medicine program was started by then President Obama and uh, it has continued. It is organized and supported and administered, I'm sorry, by the National Institutes of Health. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Francis Collin, the director of NIH, really sees this as a method of trying to prevent disease. Uh, for example, with the All of Us program, it is a program where we are analyzing a body's uh, genomic profile to find out what is that uh, person at risk for. So if you know at age 25 that you're at risk for diabetes, 
we can get a lot of information about that now while you're young and you're not uh, demonstrating any of those effects mm -hmm. and then uh, find out how to prevent it and know how to watch for it. So if a person knows they're at risk for not only uh, diabetes, but for other things, Alzheimer's, uh, if one knows that genetically and from your genomic profile that you're at risk for that, then you can take charge. So it's really um, not really a research program. And I call it a prog program of being able to take, take charge of yourself, <laughs> to know about yourself, and therefore prevent many disease processes. Mm -hmm. uh, but if there are already uh, symptoms and manifestations of disease, you can find out about it, whether your children might be at risk of the same problem. Uh, another area that we're getting tremendous information about, triple negative breast cancer, uh, yes. more commonly seen in African-American women. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more deadly, it spreads quicker, it's more difficult to treat because many of the medications don't work. So if you know that a medication doesn't work, it saves the patient the risk of that medication and therefore they can go on to receive medications uh, that might be more effective. Yeah. And so wouldn't it be great to develop medication case, targeted to your own genetic profile? I mean, that would be That fantastic. is correct. So knowing your genomic profile, what you mm -hmm. might be of risk mm -hmm. uh, for developing, and I say it's the take charge. I like that. Aspect. We all want to take charge of our health. <laughs> right. And it's really not a clinical yeah. trial. It's giving you the information to take charge. And I think it's so important for African-Americans because of our heritage and things related to mm -hmm. the Tuskegee trial and others, uh, we have stayed away from finding information about ourselves because we don't trust the system. Yeah. But the system has changed now. There are government directives that allow for protection of individuals participating in clinical trials. And therefore, that cannot happen now. So it's the time for us to take advantage of what we don't know so that we can yeah. take charge. Well, thank you. Own. Thank you. I, I want to talk briefly with Dr. Dawson about another study um, it's not related to all of us, but I would imagine some of the learnings perhaps may have informed some of what um, is being discussed in all of us, and, and that's the nurses health study. Um, I don't know what the, the black participation is in the nurses health study, um, and, and perhaps you might know Dr. Dawson, but can you talk a little bit about why it's important for black nurses to be a part of programs like the Nurses Health Study and frankly, all of us, um, and for um, our communities to be involved in, in um, research? I think Dr. Mitchell said it very well, is mm -hmm. that we need to be involved in the research because um, we have to dispel this myth that uh, one shoe fits all, that is not true. We each come to the table with a different profile, not only genetically, but in terms of size, in terms of uh, our health practices. And so being at the table as a part of the research process is important for us. We have many nurses that are nurse scientists and they are working collaboratively on interprofessional research teams. We have nurses that are nurse coordinators and they're working alongside with physicians and others uh, to recruit individuals into research uh, projects as well as enroll and follow them during that process. Mm -hmm. And I also appreciate that, that Dr. Mitchell mentioned that things have changed somewhat now because a patient can agree to enter into a clinical trial, but then if they want to opt out, they have that opportunity to opt out. So it's not as if someone can force them to stay in a study mm -hmm. if they don't want to. And for nurses, it is important. We try to participate at all level of research. Uh, rather, we are the lead in the PI, what they call the principal investigators, or working alongside with other nurses and other disciplines. Uh, and there's a lot of surveys that do come out. Um, 
addressing issues with nurses and we try our best to participate in those mm -hmm. because we understand that in order for it to have a voice at the table you also need to have participation there as well so it's not just about being at the table but making sure then that the representation of the study is going to be representative of the population mm -hmm. uh, so that whatever emerges from that study as outcomes to improve health that we have the individuals from the black and brown communities that are part of that study so that we're not just being given medication and treatment and all the research been done on the majority and then we don't know the specific uh that you know if you're talking about an african-american female or african-american male or a hispanic or a native american we're all going to have a genetic makeup that's a little bit different and understanding right. just those small differences could be the difference between taking a medication and having that medication react the way you would expect for it to or not. Because there are some medications that are just not good for us, you know. For example, ACE inhibitors, yeah. a lot of people may know about those. You mm -hmm. put us on them and it just doesn't work for us. And so if we're not a part of the trial, then we don't identify those things early on. We start identifying them once treatment is being given to us. And by that time, we may have already suffered some mishap from that treatment. So I, and I then really we also, if I may mm -hmm. add, mm -hmm. uh, we also have patient advocates on the clinical trials. So we need to make sure that we are getting into the development of the study, mm -hmm. making sure that our community, uh, community leaders are a part of the organization of the clinical trials such that uh, we have our patient advocates tell us this is not appropriate for mm -hmm. XX community or this would be great. And they can actually go back to the community and influence others, their churches, uh, their organizations, their block captains, uh, which I find in Philadelphia are really important in terms of getting information out to the community. And they tell us as investigators, what will work, what won't work, mm -hmm. uh, what this doesn't do for the community. And they can be a part of the trial. And we actually include those individuals in the development structure of uh, clinical trials, even before the clinical trial has been um, organized and the administration of it completed so that we make sure it's appropriate for yeah. our community. And, and that is so important. Um, and there's we, another aspect that the community can really participate in, and that is with our institutional review boards. Mm -hmm. Those are the boards that actually review research protocols and proposals. So in most of these, uh, we call them RBs, have seats on those boards for community members. So especially whether you are at a large university such as Duke or Emory, UAB or Stanford or Yale, they're- or Jefferson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, but they're looking to have those community representatives mm -hmm. on there. So that again, they have eyes and ears from the community looking at how these studies are being put together and examining the integrity of the of the protocols. So it's very important for our listener to understand that if, if them or someone in their family or church won't be involved in research, that's another avenue where they can have a voice and we need their voices there. Yeah. So I've got a couple questions from, from the listeners. Actually, there's, there's several questions um, that are popping up. Um, first to Dr. Dawson and then to, to Dr. Mitchell. Um, the question is, how can we educate and train more nurses as nurse clinical trial um, coordinators? And, and as a part of the, the broader research question, how can we make sure that our participation in trials isn't used against us? I think there's two things. The person asked the question in terms of having a more nurses trained to be um, like research coordinators um, and maybe um, working as the personnel enrolling individuals into the research. Um, first of all, I want to back up and say, I think we have to do two things. 
we want more nurses educated at that doctoral level, that PhD level, so that they're doing more than just enrolling, but they can also advocate and be a part of the research team. Uh, I, I think that is so important because both when we look at the number of African-American nurses, especially registered nurses, and the number of physicians, number of African-American pharmacists, we just do not have enough. So we have to continue to push for that higher education piece so that we are being very well educated in the research process and how to conduct our own research as well as being partnered with others' research. So we need to have that piece. There are many nursing programs around the country that actually do have at the master's level, uh, master level training and education for those nurses who wanna be research nurses or work in a clinical research unit. Uh, but then just getting more nurses to have their PhDs is important. One of the things that I'm most proud of with the National Black Nursing Association, because one of our mission is to be the voice uh, for African-American nurses to promote their education um, and also to, to serve our constituencies at the local level. That means our patients. But we have about 64% of our members have a graduate degree. And so we are really now focusing on our under 40 members and telling them to move forward, get your, your PhD at a younger age, and then continue to build your research career. Mm -hmm. Because we know we need those nurses in that sphere. But not, not only for research, but to teach. Because we do not have as many African-American faculty members. Right. Uh, so we're definitely on this, uh, this plan of, first of all, increasing the number of African-American RNs. Because out of the 3.9 million, RNs in this country, only 308,000 are African American. The yeah. entire state of California have more <laughs> registered nurses than we have for the whole population of African American nurses. So we want to encourage people to focus on encouraging people to come into this profession. And then let us assist them because we have a mentorship program, we have scholarship programs to help individuals uh, to move to that next level. Okay. Nothing pleases me more than when I see a young nurse that is 28 and she's getting her PhD and I'm hearing her talk about her research journey. And she is, you know, collaborating with physicians such as Dr. Mitchell to, to, to develop that research and to have a yeah. voice for that research. Wow, well, thank you. I know we're getting close on time and I, I wanted to put the last question to you Dr. Mitchell, you touched on this, um, but I, I really can't overstate how important this is, both to our listeners, um, but others as well, who are really concerned about participating in clinical research. So in your opinion, what do we still need to do? What would you like to see change so that African-Americans can participate in clinical research get the benefit of that participation and help contribute to improving um, medicine, therapeutics, um, and care for our community? Oh, absolutely. And I would like to add that the National Medical Association and the Cobb Institute, uh, while yes, we are working with all of us, but we have other research programs also. And one is to increase the number of black doctors in this country only about 4% of all doctors in the United States are of African-American descent. Therefore, it's more important for us to develop educational programs for doctors, mm -hmm. get more doctors going to medical school and are receiving advanced training so that they can become head of research at some place. They can become the PI we need to increase the number of nurses and others in the administrative part so that we've got people who can relate to our communities, who understand all of the nuances, who understand the diseases, and who are able to communicate uh, in a way that patients understand it. Uh, there are differences in talking to individuals in uh, ethnic or racial communities. 
And we've got to bring up those kids so that they can become educated, can become the PI and go back to their community and they will be respected. Mm -hmm. They will do what is necessary to increase this, this participation so that we've got understanding of the disease processes and understanding of the medications and the mechanism of action of those medications, understanding how they may relate to other disease processes that individuals in our community uh, experience, such that we've got people focused on the community. Unfortunately, what we have seen a lot is just increasing the numbers, not because there is a dedication to that community, but increasing the numbers. And then after one project is finished, those individuals are gone mm -hmm. and yeah. there is nothing left for the community. Right. So we need to bring more people in our community. We need to have more people participating. We need more people participating in the Black Nurses Association. We need more doctors and mm -hmm. clinicians involved in the National Medical Association such that the number of participants increases. So my um, um, message to individual students, learn. Put your pathway in front of you and you go for it. Okay. Find your mentors, find those who can help you, find the scholarship or whatever is needed to keep you on your path, but stay on your path, go to others and ask, and we'll see more individuals. Mm -hmm. And therefore we'll have, uh, and of course my military background, I say a bigger army or a bigger air force or bigger military uh, bringing more people in so that we have a more uh, uh, effective force behind the issues of medical care. Well, medical care in this country uh, still is way behind in terms of yeah. African-Americans. And that's true for other um, mm -hmm. underrepresented minorities as well. Uh, we've got to make sure that we're pulling up everybody and taking well, care of everybody. I'm, I'm gonna have to give you the last word on that. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Martha Dawson, Dr. Edith Mitchell. Um, we have more questions, we will answer them, but I just wanna thank you for your work, for your expertise, for your leadership, and um, for taking care of those who are on the front line and educating us about the importance of research. Thank you very much. Okay. And now I'd like to invite another perspective. Andrea King Collier is an award-winning journalist and author and a collaborate, collaborator of the Black Women's Health Imperative on the All of Us program. She's also the author of two books, Still With Me, A Daughter's Journey of Love and Loss and A Black Woman's Guide to Black Men's Health. Both books talk about the importance of participating in clinical research from a very uh, personal perspective. Hello. Hey, Andrea. So uh, how are you faring in this time of COVID-19? Well, I have not had it. <laughs> That's a good thing. But I cannot tell you how many days that I don't start a story out with in the age of COVID. Yeah. So I'm about wore out on COVID. <laughs> Yeah, you and, and so many of us, I, I think, um, right. judging by the numbers of folks who were in restaurants and bars last weekend, I, I think that is the case. Um, but you've written about COVID-19 um, from a journalist's perspective. Um, and and as, as you both write your stories and read other stories, what stands out most to you about the impact of COVID-19 on, on the Black population? Well, it has definitely shown the underbelly of health disparities. We knew it, the black community knew it, but it was like the rest of America discovered that we have these things out there that make black and brown people more predisposed 
to whatever comes along in addition to the things that are already killing us, that are already uh, decreasing our quality of life. So for me, I mean, I was shocked as anybody that when they started talking about COVID being so linked to the black community, I, I think that one of the big things is people need to understand it's not that COVID follows black people around. And we got a lot of work to do to address these other things in addition to COVID. All right. I remember in the media in February, the stories were, you know, a bit of mythology. Black people couldn't get COVID-19. Right. And then we fast forward two months or so, and, and now the stories are written differently, which are, well, black people get COVID-19, so the rest of us don't need to worry. Um, you know, the way media, re the way health is reported and health disparities are reported in the, in the media has always been a, a challenge. Can you talk a little bit about how the, the, the media is sort of handling um, this, this change in um, realization about who's impacted by COVID-19? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, it's a, I feel like it's a fluke. I feel like it's like the story of the week because they have to do 24 seven COVID. Like today, that was a big story again for some reason, but it's gonna go away if we black folks let it. I mean, we need to keep pushing the envelope on knowing more about our health, uh, reading more stories, being more informed, informing influencers like whoever that was that said that it didn't affect black people. I mean, some of those people are the people we also need to be getting to. Uh, so one of the big questions is, as things start to open up, what will we do? Mm -hmm. And that'll be really interesting. You know, before I got on this call, I heard that they were gonna open up churches. Yep. And a lot of people have been waiting to go to church and I'm gonna say, you better wait until it's safe. So that's, that's an interesting kind of issue. You know, is it the journalist's responsibility to, to say that? I mean, obviously you have an opinion, but in writing, is it your responsibility to debunk these myths, to hold researchers accountable? Uh, me personally, I try hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I I try hard. And if you look at CNN any given evening, which is like my habit of choice, you'll see people tippy toe around and still trying to get the message out. And mm -hmm. I think that everybody needs to listen to the science, listen to the data, just like with these with clinical research. Mm -hmm. The data will lead you a lot of places. But as you know, you and I have talked about this before, for a long time, they didn't collect data on what was going on with Black people. Yep, that's right. I would call some of my colleagues in, in March and said, so, and say, well, where's their data by race and ethnicity and, you know, kind of crickets. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about all of us. Um, sure. you, you heard what Dr. Dawson and, and Dr. Mitchell had to say. Um, they're looking at it from the clinician researcher perspective. Uh, at the end, um, we heard um, the, uh, Dr. Dawson talk about advocates. So you're working with us on all of us, um, not from a research perspective, but you're, you're hearing and you're focused on individuals, their experiences, their stories. So why is it important to hear from sort of, I'll, call, I'll say the everyday woman, um, and from people who don't see patients or work with test tubes every day? I can tell you that I sat in a room with some of the All of Us partners and I knew it was a real thing and I knew it was important for black and brown people to be involved. But then there were women in the room talking about why they were doing it. So there were people in the room who had gone through the enrollment period online had gone to a medical center and given their biologic specimen and they were a part of the program and they brought me to tears because one woman has a third bout of breast cancer and she 
pretty much feels that it's not going to help her specifically, but maybe that will be her legacy. Maybe it will help next generation. And Lord knows our generations need some help when it comes to health. So those are some really powerful things. I guess everybody on this call has lost somebody to hypertension, to stroke, to heart attack things. So wouldn't it be wonderful if you could participate and make a difference? Yeah. So with, with COVID-19 going on, um, you know, obviously it's got our focus on research. If people are interested, how can they get more information on what all of us is and, and how to participate? They can go to www.joinallofus.org and you can get information there. You can also enroll there. Now, what you can't do because of COVID is you can't go and take the next step. You can start the process. You can get into the, the system. You can give them some of your health information and they will get back to you when they are set up again mm -hmm. to take blood specimens and everything else that they need. But this is a good time while everybody's cooped up in the house to get online and sign up. And remember what Dr. Dawson said, if at any given point, this is a 10 year study. So if at any given point you don't want to do this anymore, you can opt out. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, um, Andrea King Collier. We're going to wrap this up and thank you for your work. Thank you for collecting the stories and telling the stories of, of black women. We appreciate it. Thank you. And I want to thank you all for listening. The history of clinical research in this country is absolutely fraught with racism, gender discrimination, and institutional and provider bias. Uh, we often talk about evidence-based medicine, but what becomes evidence depends on what questions are being asked and who's asking the questions and how the data is being interpreted. And it also depends on whom we're collecting the data from. So we end up applying a body of evidence to a population that had nothing to do with its creation in the first place. And that matters. The number one reason people don't participate in research is they're not asked. And that's true for everybody. But for black people, the reason they're not asked often stems from assumptions about whether or not their providers think they'll comply with a treatment regimen or their comorbid conditions um, that may disqualify them or interfere with the study, or frankly, concerns about their ability to pay. An NIH study published in 2019 found that from 2011 to 2015, of 158,000 applications to NIH for its highest level of research funding, only 948 were from black researchers. So in addition to all of us, the Black Women's Health Imperative is leading another effort with our colleagues from Stand Up to Cancer and Friends of Cancer Research called TEACH, Trained Empowered Advocates for Community Health. You, you heard Dr. Dawson talking about advocates earlier. And the purpose is to educate Black women on the clinical trial and drug development process and to train them on how to participate in a way that works for them. At the same time, we'll be working with providers so they can understand how to engage with Black women in a way that is inclusive and respectful. So here we are in a mad dash to develop vaccines and treatments for COVID-19. There will be hundreds, if not thousands of participants. My fear is that too few will be black. There's a lot at stake here. We all have our reasons why when it comes to participating in research. Some want to close the disparities gap. Some, as Andrea said, want to leave a legacy for their children, but there are equally strong reasons for why not. Yes, we need informed and empowered black participants, and that's what all of us in TEACH aimed to accomplish. But we have to ensure that research is done in a way that's inclusive, respectful, and values the lived experiences of black men and women. This means having research processes, institutions, and funding mechanisms that reward this type of research, and that there are sufficient numbers of researchers who understand and share these lived experiences. 
For more information on all of us or to sign up, go to joinallofus.org or allofus.bwhi.org. And for information on TEACH, go to teachforblackwomen.org. We'll post the links after the show. Join us next Friday for a discussion about an epidemic within this pandemic, and that's HIV. We'll talk about how we're building community and our continued work to end the HIV epidemic together. Until then, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Be safe and be well.